and welcome to the Culture and Sports Podcast, where we believe culture is critical to long-term success. I'm Wes, he's Mike, and we're your hosts. And today we have a very special guest, um, a leader in all aspects of life, a father, a teacher, a coach, a coach, our founder, uh, Jeremy Piasecki. The founder. The founder. The founder. <laughs> Jeremy Piasecki. How you doing, boss? I'm great. How are you today? You know, we're doing well. Yeah, we're doing well. You know, it's uh, <laughs> it's going to be a good night. We got um, a lot of stuff to talk about, a lot of interesting things. Um, and honestly, I mean, we just want to ask you a little bit about yourself and, and kind of have you um, uh, explain how you got involved in, in, in culture and sports in the first place. Well, that's a great that's a great question. Um, I guess I'll start off with uh, why I like sports and, and, and what drives me with sports. So I started playing sports in my youth. Um, I started with like rec soccer uh, and, you know, a tiny bit of club soccer. Uh, and I eventually went on to actually play a little bit of semi-pro soccer as a, as a young adult. Uh, but nice. where my aquatic experience came in was uh, when we first moved to California, when I was in elementary school, I actually drowned in someone's pool. Uh, and luckily, uh, one of the kids of the owners of that pool, like, pulled me out uh, about 30 seconds into me drowning. Um, oh, and my parents said, no, we need to get Jeremy into swim lessons. So um, I started <laughs> I started to swim. Yeah, no, no, and so I did both for a while. Um I, uh, you know, did recreation and club swimming early on, and then I started beca- uh, competing at high performance levels uh, later on. Um, I also played water polo a little bit before high school, a little bit in high school, and a little bit in college as well. Uh, I actually spent most of my water polo playing career uh, professionally when I was in Germany and for one year in Italy as well. Um, I've coached at all levels uh, in um, swimming and water polo, uh, and even a little bit of soccer at the recreation club, high school, high performance, professional, international levels. Um, I honestly think that um, sports are a way to connect people, communities, and even countries and people from different countries. Um, sports develops uh, future leaders um, and citizens of those same communities uh, that people are living in and, and competing in. Um, and sports also helps athletes learn resiliency, uh, leadership skills, working together in team settings, uh, even if the sports are individual, like swimming and track, uh, you know, cross country, stuff like that. Uh, even in practices for individual sports, athletes have to learn how to train together and share resources. So even with individual sports, uh, there's still a team component, and that's where all of those learned skills come in. And, and that's honestly why I just love sports and what my background is itself in sports. So it's, it's pretty crazy to me how you kind of, uh, you know, you got kind of thrown in back, you know, just kind of bringing it back when you were younger. Uh, you know, soccer athlete, you know, that's what you thought you wanted to do. You got thrown in a pool one day and, and all of a sudden now you're now you're a, 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 an amazing swimmer. And, and it just kind of, yeah, just kind of uh, evolves, uh, which is super interesting. And it's cool to hear, you know, kind of how you how you evolved into that. Um, one of the things that you were mentioning on um, a little bit earlier is, you know, uh, bringing countries together, things like that. Uh, you've done some really interesting things, and, and I want you to kind of talk about it a little bit, if you would. Uh, in 2008, I know that you uh, started a, 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 an amazing endeavor, and, and I just want you to kind of break into it a little bit and, and kind of uh, let us know uh, what happened in 2008 for you. Uh, of course. So uh, in 2008, I was in Afghanistan, uh, the first time I was in Afghanistan, um, and I ended up finding a a empty pool filled with trash uh, on this small base in Afghanistan about an hour uh, east of Kabul. And I convinced the pool owner to, you know, to clean out the pool and fill it with water. And I would teach his, uh, the locals how to swim and play this game. So it was just, water a, it was just like football. a compound that you found? It was a compound and, and they were there and the pool was there and you just convinced this guy to, to open it up for your, for your guy? Yeah, like, so... That's pretty, that's pretty <laughs> awesome. So, right so this, pool, this pool was there. It was in a training area um, and they hadn't used it for many years. But when they did use it, it was used as a water reservoir. It wasn't used as a pool for people to swim in because as soon as the pool would fill up with water, pool would or the water would empty out, you know, to to water plants or if they were growing some vegetables for uh, the local, um, uh, you know, dining facility for the military members. So, um, you know, through uh, some people that were working with. 
the owner of that pool, I convinced them, uh, like I said before, to clean it and fill it with water. And then uh, his uh, organization like selected. Did you just pull rank? What or? was that? By convincing, was that like a rank pool? Or you're like, hey, we need to fill this up with water and put the people there in the swim? Or what was it more That's like? That's a great question. So I had to convince him what the benefit would be for him, which, nice. uh, you know, and in Afghanistan, they take sports very seriously. And they, they only want for, you know, people to be the best and to not necessarily win, but to perform at a very high level. So it took a lot of convincing why, um, um, you know, his soldiers would – none of them knowing how to swim would be willing to jump in a pool and learn how to swim and uh, also learn how to play this new game that no one else in Afghanistan ever heard of. So um, so he eventually filled the pool with water. He hand-selected selected a team, and uh, we started practicing. It was just a, a small local team, and eventually the Afghanistan National Olympic Committee heard about what we were doing, and they wanted me to help them start a national water polo program and help their <laughs> recently started national swimming program. And the national swimming program actually started that week, um, and they wanted me to help them develop it. What I didn't realize is me helping them meant that they wanted me to be involved for a long time period. Um, and obviously that was lost in translation or there was just an expectation that was never translated. But um, it's, it's been a, a, an incredible journey. And um, it's something that while I introduced the sport of water polo to Afghanistan, uh, the people uh, in Afghanistan were the, really the ones who, who started taking off with the program. And, and they are the reasons for its success today. That was going to be my next question. Um, like how receptive were they um, as a community is to you bring in a new sport as an American and, you know, just, you know, hey, guys get in the pool and it's a fun game. We throw this ball around and throw it in the hoop. Um, how, how are they as far as accepting that? And like, were they excited? So, were they kind of? Yes. So um, never in my time in coaching did I ever have an audience uh, of people that were there to watch. Um, most of the time there was like 20 to 30 people at any given time. And, um, um, you know, Sometimes people would come and take photos, uh, like American journalists or just people that were interested in what we we're doing. And I, you know, after the first couple of times, I didn't really notice the audiences, but there would be times there would be hundreds of people there, you know, just watching practice. Uh, and you said a lot of these guys are active military over there, right? They're active. Yeah. So, so they they were active military, um, and they were trying the sport because it was on a military base, uh, and they were trying the sport because it was an opportunity, obviously, for them to learn how to swim because. Uh, most people in Afghanistan do not know how to swim because their only accessible um, bodies of water at the time were like lakes or reservoirs. Like mm -hmm. swimming pools were not a thing unless you were rich or had access to them. Um, and we also estimated in 2008 there was only about 12 to 15 pools in all of Afghanistan. Um, and all of those pools were private. Um, and so, like, you know, normal people did not have access to them. And even if they did, they just couldn't afford the access to them. Um, and so, um, you know, people would come out in, in droves and watch this. And the athletes, uh, other than being a little self-conscious about, you know, participating in a sport that uh, they were new to and yeah. uh, all the people that were watching, they, they loved it. They loved every second of it. Um, you know, obviously, it was extremely difficult for them. And our standard of... Uh, in the Western world of, of what a competing team would look like was definitely uh, not the same as, as what we were working with in Afghanistan, which actually made it so much better because people were there because they wanted to be there and they wanted to learn and they wanted to succeed, um, you know, as opposed to in the Western world and sports. There are obviously different reasons why we're in sports, um, you know, but theirs was uh, like for, you know, you know, pure love of sport, for a lack of a better phrase to use. So, would you say that um, that it brought like it brought every back? I mean, it's it's culture and sports. So, I, would you say that this brought everybody a little bit closer? Uh, you know, when you had games and things like that, like community. Like, I mean, you think of all these people coming to all these games. These guys are now playing together on this, you know, in the same pool, like hanging out, playing a new sport. Yeah, I mean, it's it's got to be it's got to be pretty fulfilling to see that happen. Yeah. So. Um... In 2008, uh, towards the end of the summer, um, the Afghanistan national swimming team was having their first competition, and they invited um, the local team that I was coaching and also the national water polo team to compete. And 
you know, I don't recall much of what happened uh, at that event when it came to how people uh, competed. Uh, but what I do remember is the amount of love and support, uh, just the great culture of sports in Afghanistan, which, you know, honestly, I hadn't really seen since I started coaching at, at at my earliest times when it was just younger kids who really just wanted to be there to play sports. So there's no other real way to uh, explain how pure uh, and enjoyable it was other than uh, for, you know, people in the same country, even though it was war torn and they're one of the poorest countries in the world, you know, they just love being there. They love competing. They loved each other, even though they didn't know each other, um, even though they came from different, uh, you know, socioeconomic or just different cultures themselves uh, or different languages, they still found a way uh, to love each other and, and support it. And, and that's why um, I believe culture and sports is so important because, um, you know, you can have positive culture or leadership or you can have neg negative culture and leadership and those will either positively or adversely impact the short and long-term uh, physical, mental, and emotional health of athletes, uh, team performance, and organizational success. And that's why culture and sports was founded, and that's why it's so important to me. Absolutely. And, and when you were younger, I mean, I'm sure you had the same kind of issues. I'm sure you've had good coaches, bad coaches, and, and mm -hmm. seen the difference in kind of, you know, how it could push somebody. You know, if, if you have the same types of coaches that are always, you know, negative and doing that kind of stuff. It could be a real, you know, it's, it could be a real problem. So. It, it, exactly. And, and, and so, so some of again. the. It's, it's because every time like a plane flies over. It oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Is that my plane or, or no, is no, it my end or your accident? You, Jeremy. Hold on a second. Do I need to go back and re-say re anything no. or, or no, 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 on? No. we can we okay. edit yeah, yeah. Okay, awesome. Okay, sorry, so what was the next question? My apologies. Um, Actually, wait, should we wait You're... a second until the video comes back? Okay, okay. All right, go ahead, I'm sorry. Um, Let's see, let's uh, let's. I think you're talking here. about bad coaches, good coaches. Yeah, yeah so uh, with different coaches, I mean, you've, I'm sure you've experienced, uh, you know, good coaches and bad coaches and, and how it changes not only, you know, the atmosphere of the team, the culture of the team, but I mean, it could change you at home and, and, and make you a different person. So I feel like, you know, it's super important to have uh, good culture in sports and, and there's so many different ways to do that. And I was just going to ask you, you know, what are a couple of different ways um, that, that or, you... or but I'm sorry to cut you oh, off, please. but like, how, how did you leave the organization in Afghanistan? Like what, what kind of traits or aspects were you looking for in a coach or um, administrative Um when you left that um, to kind of set that that bar for a positive culture and to move forward in a, you know, in an uptick, if that makes sense. No, that, that's a great question. And, you know, in Afghanistan, um, in different parts of the world, people do things differently than we do here in the U.S. And uh, that was the biggest adjustment I actually had to go through as a coach or as a team administrator or, or a program administrator was that um, just because we did it a certain way in the Western world does not mean that it will uh, be successful or even work uh, in another country or another culture. And so uh, that was that was the biggest learning curve that I had as a coach. And so some of my initial um uh, goals uh, or objectives were unrealistic, uh, not because the goals and objectives themselves were unrealistic. It was just unrealistic of how I thought the organization should, uh, you know, should proceed and move forward. And so uh, we had a wonderful uh, new president that, uh, for the Water Polo and Swimming Federation come in in 2013. Um, and he really set the pathway to where we are today uh, because he wanted to solely be there for the development of water polo and swimming in Afghanistan. He wanted to be there to support the youth of Afghanistan and to get them, you know, into a pool or just even working out somewhere. So they were off of the streets and they, and they weren't susceptible to, um, 
you know, gangs or militias or, uh, you know, foreign fighters or anything else where uh, they would be in a, in a semi-safe environment. And, and, they wa- and he wanted the athletes to succeed, um, you know, both personally and in sports. And while, you know, like I said before, you know, I only introduced the sport of Afghanistan or sport of water polo to Afghanistan. Uh, but there are so many other people that were instrumental in, in its success. Um, and, and that's where those people came in. And so, um, you know, after 2013, all these different people started coming in. Like we had a basketball player who was retiring from, uh, you know, playing basketball in Afghanistan and he wanted to start coaching swimming and water polo. And even though he didn't have the technical aptitude, uh, he had everything that we wanted and it all started with his heart. And he wanted, uh, you know, everyone to be successful and he didn't want to tear people down. He wanted to prop people up and support them and support the team. And that was what, what the most important thing is. And I think that's most important for any organization. Um, and I can obviously go on talking about this for a long time, but, uh, you know, where, where is their thought process? Where is their heart? And those are the types of things that are important, uh, for a winning organization. Absolutely. No, I completely agree with you. I mean, definitely agree with you on that. Uh, So, I mean, going into that, I mean, just accomplishing all that, I mean, is that something that just paved the way for you to uh, start culture and sports? I feel like, I mean, that had to be a huge, a huge part of it. I mean, just, just that whole, that whole experience altogether. Yeah. I mean, that was definitely um, a experience itself that really pointed to me to uh, just how important culture and leadership in sports is in general. Um, but it all started from my youth. I mean, I remember early co- coaches early on, uh, some were that I, I was indifferent about. Uh, I'm sure they provided both positive and negative experiences for me. Uh, but I really remember the extremely positive coaches and the extremely negative coaches. And I just remembered uh, how they acted and, and what they were focused on. And, and most of the uh, you know negative or adverse coaches were solely focused on winning. And that was the most important thing for them. Um, and it didn't matter anything about the athletes or the teams. And and those were the experiences that about I carried with me. From a coach as a kid. There's something about, I'm sorry for cutting you off, but there's something about a negative comment from a coach as a kid that really sticks with you. Like the positive ones, you know, they'll come and they'll go, but those negative ones really, you know, kind of resonate, you know, and sometimes it's your adulthood. And I've, I've experienced that, you know, from friends. And oh, exactly. I mean, even, even as a young kid, um, I, I was a pretty big kid, especially before my teens. And I was called fat several times by many coaches. And, and while that seems a little trivial that, oh, I was a kid and I was called fat, you know, but obviously, uh, that's something that I still think about, you know, semi-frequently to this day, because someone said it in my formative years. And obviously it was someone with power and, and that demanded respect. And so if they said that I was fat, then obviously I was fat and I had to do something about it. Uh, even though there was no, um, you know, direction or, or influence of how to try and fix it. Uh, I just felt like a failure because I was a little bit bigger than I should have been. And, um, you know, those are things that definitely stick with me forever. And if you look at, um, other organizations, um, Um, you know, youth organizations or USA gymnastics or, or just, you know, gymnast clubs or, you know, cheerleading or synchronized swimming, or I'm sorry, artistic swimming now, Um, you know, there's so many stories coming out of those areas right now uh, because uh, there was so much toxicity uh, for so many years. uh, The culture just has to change. And there are some very persuasive individuals coming into the space now or have recently been there who are trying to change that culture, but it's not an overnight thing. I mean, you have thousands of people in each of these sports and they've been doing it the same way for so many years. And, uh, you know, change, change is very difficult. It's important, but it's very difficult. Absolutely. Well, it starts in the beginning, you know, you got to have somebody to, to bring attention to it. And, you know, uh, I think what you're doing right now is, is just amazing. The fact that, you know, we're, we're bringing attention to it. We're going to be uh, talking about a lot of different things that people are going to be interested in. Um, really relevant things, you know, and um, something else that'll go off was you were just speaking about uh, kind of where do you, where do you think that starts? Uh, where do you, where do you begin that? Like, how do you, how do you begin changing that? How do you, how do you begin a culture? How do you, how do you start a positive, you know, situation, organization? Um, where do you think that begins? Is that, do you believe it starts at administration? Do you believe you have to have a, um, a, a 
live in a good area? Um, do you think it's mentors, you know, coaches? Yeah. yeah. Do you think it's the people you, you recruit? Do you think it's the players that you bring in? Like, where, where do you think that starts? Who? who? Okay, so so culture in general is a top down concept. So it start, starts at the very top and it goes down. And a team climate starts at the bottom. So it start at the lowest you know level, which would be athletes at this at this stage. And uh, they come together to create a team environment. Uh, and somewhere in the middle, that's where it meets. That's the easiest you know way to explain culture and and climate. And so organizational culture starts at the top and it starts with the team owner or the general manager or the president of a board or, or however it is that the, the team or the organization is developed. Uh, that's where it starts. And, and normally those organizations or teams, their first hire or their first volunteer is a head coach. And, and that's where that uh, culture continues. And, and how that, that coach brings on other coaches and support staff, um, you know, that drives what the team culture is going to be. And so while there, the athletes or assistant coaches can develop, you know, a team climate to uh, help better their own team environment, um, the organizational culture itself starts at the top. Yeah, no, that's that's a good point. I mean, because a lot of people don't understand kind of where, you know, what comes into play and, you know, what has to be affected. So it's like, you know, you, you really got to get up there and, and figure out what's going on at the top, uh, especially if you're having issues like this, you know, you know, brought to your attention, especially in so many of the different sports that you were talking about earlier, because um, a lot of that stuff doesn't come out for years. And, you know, it's 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 already kind of established itself. So like switching it up, like you said, it's going to take some time. Right. And one of the, uh, you know, an example that I would like to give is uh, James Harden back when he was on the Houston Rockets. Um, you know, everyone was blaming him for the horrible uh, culture that was happening in that organization. But he was just an athlete while he was the star athlete um, and probably the highest paid athlete. Uh, he wasn't the cause of the, the toxicity that was in that organization. That obviously came from the top. Uh, you know, he was the favorite player and he was off doing what he wanted to do, but no one held him accountable. Right. And so regardless of what James Harden did and what people, you know, may not have liked about him and then, oh, well, you know, he was scoring for them and winning games and that's all that mattered. But in the end, he wasn't the toxic person in there. While he did, you know, probably do things that his teammates weren't, uh, you know, approving of at the time, he was the one who started and continued to foster that toxic culture. I mean, yeah, OKC has been the same way when they had all three stars on their team. You know, it's, it's not Harden's fault. You know, they had all three, like, perennial all-stars, you know, like Kyrie and KD and James Harden. Like, they had Brooklyn, they had the Brooklyn Nets earlier in the career. And now, like, you can't put that on Harden. You know, it's, it's an organizational thing. You know, it, it starts right, somewhere. Right, exactly. It's, it's, it's trying to buy championships. It's, you know, you know drafting a certain way think not worrying about you know what your players want well and holding them to account like kind of you know having accountability for your players right. and, and like you said starts out at the top if you're going to let people get away with things you're going to get away with them it's it's their it's their job to create the proper culture for the team i feel yeah. exactly Exactly. And now with James okay. Harden uh, away, you know, being traded, you know, traded away is, is the culture of the organization going to change? No, because it has nothing to do with James Harden. It has everything to do with the culture of the Houston Rockets and, and the rookies of the team and, and even some of the veteran players, they could help facilitate a positive climate, but they can't change the organizational culture. That only comes from the top. Well put. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, we talked about a couple of other, you know, things that make it, you know, makes it a toxic culture. Um, and, and, you know, there's certain examples, you know, that you mentioned earlier, but is there anything else specific like uh, that you would say that's just like a, like one of those things that you're like, hey, look, make sure you stay away from this because this definitely creates a, a bad culture. I know, um, you know, a lot of teams emphasize too much on uh, on winning, like we were saying, and not focusing on the players, where I think it all ends up contributing to the to, to winning at the end. But you know, if you don't have that positive uh, outreach to those players, like can you can you give me an ex another example of another toxic? Um, ex 
Sure. Um, you know, one of the things that I was talking to a colleague about a week or two ago was about providing an environment of learning. And, and what I mean by that is, uh, do you let your assistant coaches or even your head coach um, make, you know, decisions that may positively or, or even negatively uh, impact team performance uh, in the short term? Uh, you know, do you want a coach or an athlete to try out a new play or a new technique? And the answer always is yes. You want to provide that learning environment because if you try out something new and it, it works and it, and it uh, provides better technique or makes someone run faster or swim faster, uh, those are positive things. If it didn't work uh, or it fails, um you know, failure should be viewed as a learning opportunity, not as, as something that's negative and and that will you know impact someone's job or impact an athlete, whether they're starting on a team or or being traded from a team. Uh, you know, we need to provide those learning opportunities for uh, athletes to learn, for them to become more resilient, uh, for them to learn how to better communicate with their teammates, whether it's in a team setting or an individual sports setting, like I talked about before. Um, you know. Th- you know, those are the types of things. And if you have a coach who is like, it's my way or the highway, we're only, we're only going to do things a certain way. Uh, that normally uh, leads to l- less communication, uh, you know, expectation that things will only be done a certain way. And then obviously when things aren't done that certain way, it's a negative interaction as opposed to a positive one. And and you can see that all around the world. Um, you know, I obviously experienced that as, as a youth athlete, you probably have experienced that uh, back when you were playing as youth. I even experienced that uh, when I was playing professionally in Europe. Um, I had a coach who uh, was just stuck in his ways and was not willing to look at, you know, doing things a certain way. Um, and uh, the team was not performing at its highest level during that time because they weren't given the ability to try new things and to learn from each other and communicate and to think while they were on the run. It was always, no, we're always going to do the same thing every single play. And uh, it became redundant. Obviously, other teams saw what we were doing and they capitalized on that. And it was just a poor learning environment all around. And and I think that's where you'll see a lot of the coaches uh, where they are, um, you know, is it's always their way or the highway. Um, and uh, their teams, while they may be successful short term, if you look at long term success, a lot of those coaches aren't there long term. Right. Now, if you look at people like Bill Belichick, he's constantly changing. But but from everything that I've read and everything I've seen, um, you know, it's a, it's a continuous learning environment because there's a system in place and the system's always changing, even though it's, it's being adjusted slightly, um, you know, always on the run, but it's, it's continuously changing over time. And that's the most important to the pieces thing. that he has, you know, available. You know, like- exactly. Exactly. And so everything's changing and everyone's continuously learning. And, yeah. and, the, and that's the most important thing. And if, and, and I'm sure you've experienced yourself with coaches that are unwilling to change uh, or unwilling to learn or unwilling to even listen to their athletes because the athletes are the most important people there. And they're actually the ones who have the most amount of information because they're the ones who are seeing what's happening in practice. They know what their feelings are or their thoughts are uh, or what their bodies are telling them to do. And they can best explain uh, different things that are happening during practice or during competition uh, that coaches, you know, you know, probably learned when they were uh, competing, but it's obviously been a while since they were competing, and so they lost a little bit of that touch or that edge, we'll call it. Yeah, that's awesome insight. She she really wants to. Did you hear about the situation at Coronado High um, about the, they were stripped of their title because after the game they were throwing tortillas at the other the the fans. We're throwing tortillas at uh, what, what's Orange Glen. Orange, Orange Glen. Orange Glen. Uh, it was a predominantly uh, <laughs> Latino team, and they were throwing tortillas at them. And I believe they were just um, Coronado High's punishment was they stripped believe, the title. Uh, uh, they, they stripped them the title, but they also just prohibited them from hosting postseason competition from twenty two twenty three. Um, uh, we kind of want to get your kind of. Do you think the punishment was? Uh, justified for the whole basketball team over, you know, fans? Uh, do you think that's a, you know, that's a, a cultural thing from the school or do you think that's, you know, kind of embedded in the whole, 
environment uh, and kind of one. And the one thing that we were talking about right before this was, you know, they so they they stripped the team of their title. But, you know, at the same time, it was like, you know, is it the team? Is it the fans? So, I mean, is it fair to the players to strip them of the title for something that the fans did? And I think it's, I, it's a tough question to get into, but I thought that was a super interesting question that you brought up. And they earlier. are students. You know, they're, all, they're all students of the same school, so you kind of have to believe in the environment, you know. But we like right. to Right. So, so you, you brought up a lot of great uh, points. Um, well, I wasn't there. Um, obviously, and I don't think you two are there either, but uh, from everything I read uh, in the newspapers, um, you know, there's some confusion on whether students were directly involved in throwing tortillas or not. But, um, you know, if, if they were throwing their tortillas, then then yes, it's a team it's sport. Uh, the, the, t- the team sh- should be stripped of the title, and, and that is not only the fair, but it's the right thing to do. However, with that being said, uh, the students weren't the ones who came up with this behavior on their own. Um, it, and, and, and it wasn't from some random fa- fans that were in the stands. Uh, it came from the coaches. It came from, you know, the teachers in the school. It came from the, you know, the principal. The top. It, it, you know, it came from, you know, even the school district. And so um, while it was interesting that they fired the coach, um, I thought that was easy out for the organization to just fire the coach right. because how how did a group of fans and parents and and athletes all figure out at the same time to start throwing tortillas? There had to have been something that was learned and um, you know whether it was spoken about or not, you know, in practices or or in games, someone thought it was uh, appropriate. Uh, and you know, to get bring tortillas to the game yeah. with with the the idea of throwing them at the opposing team, uh, you know, once the game was over, and so obviously it was it was well thought out. But you know, there weren't athletes or coaches uh, or team administrator or school administrators because there were school administrators at that event that were shutting it down and stopping you know, the event when it was happening. Uh, and so everyone just kind of watched it happen. And then everyone went their separate ways. Uh, and only when the team complained uh, about the, uh, the treatment that was uh, directed at them, that's when people started reacting to it. Yeah. And so, uh, like I said before, it was interesting that they only fired the coach and they didn't do anything else internally uh, within that school or school district. Did the AD, uh, the AD should have got some kind of uh, repercussion? Uh, again, I'm not there, but the athletic director has a stake in it. The assistant principals, the principal, the assistant yeah. superintendent, the superintendents, everyone has a role in that event. And, what? you know, again, investigations. Um, probably aren't completed, and the school isn't going to probably talk, publicly talk about the discipline that's being imposed, and maybe they are digging deep, and maybe they are doing some self-reflection to really look at how they want to move forward as not only as a, as a school district or a school, but as a community at large. How do you combat this, and how do you make the environment not only safer for all the athletes that are involved, but uh, also a learning opportunity for people to learn from this and to learn in the future. So uh, important things like this don't happen again. Yeah, exactly. And since we're, I'm going to keep it like, first of all, how do you get that many tortillas into like a gym, like a security? Just smuggling uh, tortillas also, like, inside the gym. Yeah, yeah something's got to be weird. I have to have a better detector in the front. But um, another thing that's, you know, something that's coming up, has got a lot of sports news that's been kind of popping up. Um, we got the news about a couple of days ago that uh, student athletes will be starting to get paid on their name, their images, and their likeness. Um, how, how do you think that will affect, um, you know, collegiate sports? Uh, the culture in general of, of sports. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, college, you don't get paid for sports. You know, you, you wait to get paid, and now things yeah, are changing quick. You get paid for quick. jersey sales. Um, do you think that will, you know, kind of those, those top schools are just going to keep profiting again, or do you think that it will keep, you know, open up a – you know, a sector for these smaller schools and their alums to come in and kind of help these kids, you know, with their promotions and you know, advertising and kind of what do you think about that? Yeah, th- th- those are all great questions. And and obviously history will be the detector of, of how this will go. Uh, it will show us what direction, th- you know, things will happen. But, 
you know, athletes, you know, not all athletes are on scholarship, and that's a common misconception that, oh, the athletes mm-hmm. are, you know, their payment is a school scholarship. But in, in most sports outside of football and basketball, uh, most sports are mostly walk-ons. Um, and and especially at smaller smaller level schools or Division three schools, uh, they don't have, you know, all these scholarships to be thrown around. So it's important to understand that. And, and obviously only the top athletes, uh, you know, in division one, most likely are going to right. uh, get those sponsorship deals and, and get the income coming in. And so, yes, you know, some of those athletes might continue to stay in college, you know, especially in sports like basketball, where a lot of those athletes are one and done. Maybe they'll continue to participate with their team before they, they decide to turn professional. But, um, at this time, I think that the NCAA has liked the autonomy that they've worked with for so long, uh, where they've been able to say, this is how we're going to do things, and there's no one who's going to question us on it. And I think this is a real interesting turn of events, and it will be interesting to see if the NCAA or the conferences have the same power that they had before. And what I mean by that is where they, whatever they said went, and no one could question them or argue them at all. And if they were, they were censured or uh, suspended in, in some way, shape, or form. So and, that's and what I actually think is the most interesting. At the same yeah. time, don't you think exactly. it might be able to give them a little bit more accountability? Hey, look, you know, you, you mess up in school, you mess up in this, you, this is gone. You could be making money now, but, you know, you're in college right now, and, and it, it could be something to say, and, you know, I mean, almost kids, take it away kids from Kids are making money already. You know, kids are making people are getting cars and, you know, free, you know, stay here and, you know, gifts, mm-hmm. gifted this and gifted that. They'll say supposedly on that. But, know, so, I mean, yeah. like, why not? Let well, it's, it's the same thing. It's legally. the same thing with betting on sports. I mean, betting on sports was happening so frequently, but it wasn't regulated. Exactly. And so it was happening anyways, just, just like athletes being paid. There, are, there were athletes being paid. There's been athletes who have openly come out and said they were being paid, right. you know, not at the time when they were competing, but later or when they were already professional athletes. Uh, mm-hmm. But um, it's interesting to see what will happen now and the change of the NCAA and the, the higher earning universities. Uh, how they will change. And so that's yeah, yeah. what I think the most interesting is in the culture of collegiate sports in itself. Yeah, you have kids, I mean, getting BMWs and cars and stuff like that. And then getting like, but the, the schools making millions and millions of dollars off jersey sales and commercials. And even after 10 years after they're gone, I mean, Reggie Bush would probably be the highest paid athlete in the world if he was collecting on his jersey sales at USC from, you know, from beginning to end. Like, <laughs> Matt Liner, like, those guys were, you know, killing it, you know? But they right, didn't exactly. Die, and they got in trouble, you know, for, you know, having this little thing on the side or, you know, collecting this little bit, you know, from this booster or that booster. Just going to be interesting to see if that's going to, you know, what's that going to change for the athletes? Is that going to make them feel more of a professional where they don't mess around and get in trouble or is that going to give them a bunch of money to go out and mess around and just so they have an, an opportunity to make it make it either a good culture or a bad culture give right in there op- right when they have that opportunity, that opportunity yeah. to make well, well again it, it's not the athletes who are going to make that culture they're gonna they're going to form the climate of their teams uh, and of the athlete base of the NCAA. The NCAA themselves and the conferences and the institutions are the ones who are going to create that culture. And are they going to be supportive and embracing those athletes with these new changes, or are they going to try and stop it every way possible? But I think there's a win-win for everyone here, um, and I'm excited to see it, and I really hope it comes to fruition. Yeah, definitely be an interesting thing to see. Yeah, too. Well, let's see. Probably a new chain, something you know that we've been waiting for, asking for 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 the longest time. You know. So, yeah, and it's interesting that you bring up change uh, in that phrase because we've been talking about this whole time. But but change is very scary for everyone. Uh, you know, whether it's an athlete or or coaches or you know administration at school or at the NCAA. Uh, you know, change is extremely scary because we don't know what the destination is going to be for that change. And so, um, you know, obviously a lot of people are scared of how it's going to turn out, but if everyone is, you know, positive and, and they try for the betterment of all f- during this change, I think it will be successful for everyone. 
Nice. Yeah, I feel, I feel like if, if they could do that and they could put it on the right track right away, then it could be a good thing. Uh, but you're, you're right. It's got to start from the top and it's, it's, it's got to move down from there. That's my only, that's my only, you know, problem is there's no regulation on it. Like who's regulating, you know, where this money is coming from, who's getting these kids this money. But other than that, I, I get it, you know, but there should be some kind of regulatory, you know, factor in, you know, finding out where these funds are coming from, you know, who they're coming from, you know, how much, you know, and why, you know, those are, those are things that could be, because you can't, because then you're going to start signing contracts and these kids are going to be 16, 17 year olds signing contracts and monetizing themselves and not knowing what they're getting themselves into. Yeah. That's a nice exactly. that really huge issue. Exactly. But, and I think this is definitely the first step uh, towards, towards that success. Yeah, I definitely agree. Definitely agree. Um, so, I, I mean, we've got a lot of this, you know, a lot of culture stuff going on right now. Where do you see culture and sports going in, in the recent future, in the, in the near future here? I mean, I know, I mean, we've, you've, you've been working, you know, so hard. I see everything expanding so quickly. Uh, what's the next step for you? So, uh, so just a few months ago, uh, our organization is only uh, about a half a year old. Um, and we just started with a couple writers uh, writing about um, either uh, our own experiences or uh, current events when it came to leadership or culture and sports. And so we started writing about that. And now we're, we're transitioning also to adding a podcast to what it is we're doing. And eventually we're going to uh, add video segments. Uh, we're going to develop some curriculum and courses. Uh, we're going to continue to work with uh, universities and colleges, speaking to uh, their student base about all things leadership and culture and sports and we're going to continue to uh, try and interact with uh, you know collegiate organizations high schools districts uh, club teams national governing bodies professional sports teams uh, to help assess identify uh, opportunities where uh, culture can be improved uh, for the betterment of not only the team and the organization itself but it's also short and long-term uh, health of athletes Nice. No, that's awesome. That's going to be, yeah. I mean, that's going to be super helpful. And I, I feel like a lot of people are going to be grateful um, that you're able to, to do that and kind of be able to just help people as they go. I mean, visiting these different places, uh, kind of explaining, you know, kind of what you went through in general and, uh, you know, what creates a good culture and things like that. I mean, I that's can, just helpful. I can speak for both of us. We're super excited to be a part of this. And yeah, absolutely. Be, you know, kind of doing this with you, with you guys. And I'm glad you guys brought us along and um, we're excited to see where this goes and what we can, how we can contribute. So, Jeremy, thank you so much. Um, thank you very much for having me today yeah, and, and yeah. for giving me the opportunity to speak about leadership and culture and sports. Well, no, it was amazing, and you know, I, I guarantee we're going to have you on again. Uh, we're going to do a, a, probably a few more. You got so many interesting things to talk about. We'll so. think about it. We'll talk about it. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll, have a, we'll have a board meeting and we'll talk about it if we want to have you back. No, I'm just playing. But yeah, thank you so much, Jeremy. Thank you very much. Jeremy, thanks, bud. Have a great one, man. We'll we, we, we don't have to get off. We can we can pause just, it. Yeah, just so now we'll